My name is Brittany Lee Lewis, and I'll be your host. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode on American politics. I'm excited to announce today's guest, Representative Nima Kulkerny. She is an American immigration attorney and a Democratic member of the Kentucky House of Representatives, representing District 40. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So I, I want to get our viewers a sense um, of who you are. So if you wouldn't mind telling them a little bit about what motivated you um, to run for office and how you got involved in politics. Sure. So I think what got me started in policy work initially, rather than politics, um, I never really envisioned myself as, a, as an elected office, and I still don't consider myself a politician. Um, but I think what really kind of solidified it in my mind is immigration law, which is one of the most political areas of law that we have in America. Um, it is very, very changeable based on who's in charge, based on what their priorities are, whether they really it boils down to whether they want to restrict immigration or whether they want to expand immigration. And so I was very finely attuned to different administrations, how they approached immigration policy, what changes they were making, really to see how they would impact my clients. Um, but I also do a lot of advocacy pro bono work. So just immigrants in general, um, how is our country viewing them this four years, you know, four years at a time, which is not the best way to uh, conduct an, an immigration system for a country this size, but that's where we are. And so what I saw essentially, and this was true I think in 2018 when I ran for office, is there were a lot of people, and I'm a state representative, so we have two year terms. A lot of people looked at the election in 2016 and kind of woke up the next day and were like, what happened? What just happened? I can't believe we're here two years into that administration or you know a year and a half or so it was it was clear that immigration was a very specific priority for this administration and it was not one that was trying to expand immigration make immigrants feel welcome um, anything like that so i was looking around and saying i think i can do a little bit more to help people um, rather than on a case-by-case -case basis if i was able to influence the policy and one of the reasons I ran for state rep, because, you know, immigration law is federal, so a lot of people ask, why did you not just run for Congress? Um, a, we have a fantastic congressman, but, you know, the, the main reason is I'm seeing a shift um, to the states, to state legislatures, since Congress, right, is pretty gridlocked and there's not a lot of people expecting a whole lot um, right. from the federal government. So a lot of that is shifting to state legislatures and local city city metro councils things like that but there was you know you can see a lot of these federal issues coming down to the state level now um, and you saw a lot of that shift occur after the 2016 election so i knowing all of that having all of that background was looking around and saying what is my state representative doing um, and it was an individual that had been in office for 20 plus years and really wasn't engaged, was not engaging the district. Um, and so I decided that I would run to represent District 40 um, and the people of Kentucky in a little bit more engaged way. Mm, excellent. Uh, I wanna stick with the topic of immigration for a second. So, um, sure. As you just discussed, immigration is, is something that it means a lot to you. You work as an immigration attorney. Um, obviously, you know, President Trump and this administration, um, they continue to argue that black and brown immigrants bring crime, steal jobs. Um, how does this type of rhetoric and belief system affect immigrants, um, you know, nationwide, but also within your district? You know, it's it's a sad thing, but anytime I have information seminars or I talk to different groups of people about immigration law um, in this country, I, I say that to them. I say, since the 1790s, did you know um, that we've basically been using the same anti-immigrant rhetoric, which is that immigrants are criminals, immigrants are stealing our jobs, and immigrants bring diseases. Like, that literally has not changed um, since essentially the founding of our country. And it's the kind of rhetoric that we've seen, again, in terms of expansion or restriction um, of our immigration system, we've seen the same rhetoric and we've seen it, you know, doubling, doubling down in this administration for sure, but it's been used, you know, in previous administrations as well. Um, and, and one of the things that it does is, of course, hurt, you know, people that 
that are trying to immigrate. It, it's certainly something that they feel, but America continues to be a beacon and it always has been a beacon of opportunity, right? Freedom to pursue um, your dreams and your goals. And so I don't know that that's necessarily dissuaded anybody, just the rhetoric part of it, mm -hmm. um, because immigrants work hard. You know, they know what they want um, and they want to be able to do it without having government get in the way, having um, unfair systems get in the way. And so that's what America has represented to most people, including refugees, including individuals that immigrated for economic purposes or family purposes. Um, and so I would say that while it's something that we've heard and we felt, it's not necessarily touched us to the degree that it has under this administration, um, where there has, there has been a shift in terms of not just rhetoric, but policy mm. that is, is founded on deterring by being cruel. You know, so the policies are kind of like not based on rational economic theory. They're not based on what is actually going to help the country. They're ba it's based on, I want to scare people. I want to intimidate people. I want to threaten people. I want to make sure that people don't see this country as a beacon anymore. And that is devastating in terms of our status on the world stage. And it's devastating to the immigrants that live here. So that's a very uh, disconcerting trend. Do you think there's a difference, though, in terms of which immigrants are um, worthy of still coming here, even under the changing policy with the Trump administration? I think it's interesting when we look at the First Lady, um, her background, right? Um, but also the rhetoric that has come from um, Donald Trump and, and, and specifically, you know, thinking about the, the Muslim ban attempts or thinking about kind of the negative comments related to Haiti um, and those that are coming over from Nigeria. Um, do you think there is some type of distinction um, that is... Uh, I guess, impl implicitly or explicitly um, being made there. Absolutely. Um, and so it, it deserves to be mentioned that our immigration system has always been based on racial, um, you know, inequality. And so you see that in the systems in terms of who we've ever let into the country. And it's always been a preference for Europeans. So it started out with Northern Europeans and then Western Europeans. They didn't want Eastern Europeans. Those three didn't want Southern Europeans. Um, and so at every stage of our country, you've had a set of immigrants that, that didn't want subsequent generations of immigrants to come, <laughs> you know, to come to America and do what they did. Um, and so I think it's, it's always been there. This is, this is the basic fundamental bedrock of our system is keeping people out, keeping certain people out. And before 1965, the Immigration Act of 1965, this is something that I've been talking about more and more given the sort of civil um, unrest and discord that we're seeing in our cities when it comes to racial justice, police reform, that kind of thing. And I you know, always mention that black and brown immigrants were not welcome in this country until they were forced to be welcomed by removing national origin quotas in 1965. And the only reason they were able to do that is because of all of the civil rights um, protests, all of the actions that were taken by black people, uh, black and brown people that were in this country that forced our country to move forward on that level and provided the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act. So the Immigration Act of 1965 that allowed immigration of more black and brown people was born out of that same movement. And it's important to remember that because we've got immigrants now that are like echoing the same mentality as, as the past, you know, founders. They're like, we don't want anyone else coming here. I made it. I'm not going to open the door. I'm going to shut the door behind me. And that's a, that's a very dangerous mentality. And it's a mentality, you know, that is identifying with someone that has chosen to oppress you um, in the past. And it's a history that I think we need to recognize and come to terms with as immigrants ourselves. Absolutely. Very nuanced. <laughs> um, so I want to transition a little bit. You will go down in history as the first Indian American elected as a state representative in Kentucky. Uh, what does that achievement mean to you? And what are some of the challenges, if any, that you've experienced as an Indian American representative? 
So it's been very, very gratifying, not because I, I didn't run to, to be having the label, right, of the first Indian to, to be elected to the state legislature. I saw a need for our district and I ran because I thought I could do a better job. Um, and, you know, that's fundamentally what, what it is. But what I've seen since I've been elected is a lot of younger people, younger girls, South Asian women, um, you know, minorities from, from every country who have come here, people that have come here as refugees, people that have come here um, for economic advantage, a lot of immigrant groups. It doesn't matter how old they are. And this is the part that gratifies me. It's not just younger people, it's older people that have not been engaged in politics necessarily the whole time they've been here, but now are seeing me and seeing that this is a really, it's, a, it's an avenue that's been opened up. Um, and it's something that they should be paying more attention to. And I think, of course, that's true, again, because of the policies of this administration and like everything has been thrown into very sharp relief by COVID. Um, but I'm seeing a lot of engagement and a lot of people paying a lot more attention to policy. And so that result, I think, is the thing that makes me the most glad that I ran and won is to have people that were not necessarily engaged or spoken to on a political level feel now that they are included and seen. I think that's been the most important and uh, most encouraging thing that I've seen since being elected. Absolutely. So you, let's talk about your endorsements a little bit um, and some of your policy. So you have several yeah. union endorsements, um, including the Greater uh, Louisville Central Labor Council and the Kentucky State AFL-CIO. Um, in your biography, you discuss your family-owned and operated business called the 8 to 8 Grocery Store in Germantown. You talk about, uh, you know, you and your brother worked there delivering groceries. Uh, at a time when millions of Americans, including those in Kentucky, uh, are out of work, how will you work to balance the needs of um, small businesses um, while also balancing the rights of workers and the working class? Yeah, so this is, uh, this is a very important topic. And, and I think I'll start with fairness to workers. Um, you know, I'll, I'll start there because one of the things that we're finding over the past decades is this greater and greater divide between the people, the haves and the have nots. So today, a person working a minimum wage job, which again, the minimum wage hasn't changed for decades. It has not reflected the cost of living. It has not reflected inflation. Um, so it's been the same. Meanwhile, it's much, much more expensive to live. So you can't live on a full-time job at minimum wage. So you have people that are working multiple jobs just to put food on the table. They can't afford healthcare. They can't afford childcare. They can't afford to save money. They're living paycheck to paycheck because they can't, that's all they can do. There's not enough time in the day. They have to work all the time just to make do. Um, that impacts home ownership. It impacts taxes. It impacts property values. It impacts a lot of different things that we don't normally think about because we tend to look at people and say, well, you should just work harder or you should get more education and get a better job as though it's that simple to do, you know? Um, student debt is one of the things in this past, I had a primary actually this past June against the same individual I beat in 2018. Um, and I had a lot of younger people contact me. So they didn't necessarily care what my policies were that I said, they were very concerned about what, what I was committed to doing. Um, and just being, for instance, a Democrat didn't necessarily mean anything to them. You know, what are you going to do about my student debt? What are you going to do about my access to health care? What are you going to do about the environment? Are you, are you doing anything about climate change? Or do you have any policies for renewable energy growth in Kentucky? And those are the things that you have to look at. So you have to look at... Um, what are we doing, for instance, for our coal miners in Eastern Kentucky? Coal, coal is not coming back. You know, we've, we've had a senator um, in Kentucky for 40 years, about 40 years, who has kept saying coal is coming back, coal is coming back, and it's not. <laughs> Meanwhile, we had all of this time where we could have invested and retrained in the people, and so they could have jobs in the growing renewable energy sector. And we, we haven't done that, but we're going to have to do that um, and it's just, it's, it's very disappointing that it's caused so much suffering for people for so many decades, and it could have been avoided simply by a shift in prioritizing a certain policy over another policy. 
Um, and I tend to look at things like that through a lens of is how is this helping people? How is this going to get people more access to healthcare? How is it going to help people get a better wage? Um, you know, and in Kentucky, I'm in the super minority party, so I don't get a whole lot um, of leverage in terms of my vote. Um, but we have to talk about these issues. And when we do get back in the majority, we have to implement these issues because we were in the majority and we didn't solidify these, right? We didn't make sure that they were protected as much as they should have been. And so we find ourselves now um, just sort of talking about why this is important, but we can't do a whole lot. And so I'm, I'm hopeful, obviously, to work with the other side uh, of the aisle and say, look, this is about people. It's not about politics. Um, we've got to invest in the people that we're, we're saying that we're representing. And the best way we can do that is giving them a healthy uh, way of life, right? A way for them to feed their kids, a way for them to send kids to school, to fund public education. Um, these are not radical ideas. Um, they're pretty basic ideas. And I think that's, that's kind of where I start is let's just get everybody on the same page and then we can all move forward together. I love what you said there. This is about people. It's not about politics. Um, because I think so often that's lost, right, in what seems to be political theater um, to the average American, um, which actually brings me to my next topic uh, along kind of race and the protests that we've seen, we've seen nationwide, um, well, worldwide at this point, largely around, uh, in more recent days, George Floyd and, of course, um, Breonna Taylor, uh, which I know is... Uh, something very close to you and your state. Um, you know, millions of Americans have been outraged by what they believe was the obstruction of justice at the hands mm -hmm. of Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron. Uh, yeah. What are your thoughts regarding the situation? And, and what do you think the community and legislators can do to stop the death of um, unarmed Black citizens? Yeah, I mean, this is this is a question that goes back to what are we doing about systemic racism? I think some of the conversations that we're having for the first time um, in some of our communities goes back to that, to just understanding that this even exists. There are people that don't believe there's such a thing. They, You hear people say things like, I don't see color, I don't see race. Um, but that doesn't mean anything, right? You have to see color, you have to see race, because you've had systems of oppression for as long as this country has existed, right? Um, this is not anything new. So in order to fix that, you have to move far, far over to the other side in order to sort of right that balance. And so I think what we're seeing is sustained protests, right? So the level of sustained protests that we're seeing hasn't been seen in this country since the 1960s because there's just there's just such an overflow of emotion and exasperation and anger that we are continuing. Like this just keeps happening over and over and over every few days, every day, somewhere in the United States. And you know, what's happened at this point in Kentucky, in Louisville, and certainly everywhere else in the country is this narrative that if you are with the protesters, you are against the police, which is simply not true. You know, you hear these these uh, phrases like defund the police, which I think in you know per my personal opinion is a terrible uh, phrase because nobody's talking about defunding the police. What they're talking about is taking funds that were allocated to militarization of the police, to escalation techniques, to things that are not community policing, and shifting it to make the focus on if you are having mental health issues, the first thing you're not confronted with is a gun. To your face. Mm -hmm. You have somebody there who's maybe qualified um, to talk to you or figure out what is going on. And that is what we have got to get back to. It's not about the police. I don't think it's not about the police not doing their job. I don't think they should have to do the job of a social worker. I don't think they should have to do the job um, of a, of a health, mental health care professional. Um, they are there for law enforcement, right? To keep the community safe, to protect and serve. And that's their job. That's what it should be. There's been a shift, uh, a, a gradual shift, because no one's really paid that much attention to it, where the budgets of these, and the training, right? So the training is this sort of us against them, and you can see the results of that on the street. You see the result of not viewing the community that you serve as people, but you see them as 
criminals or against you in some way. So, you know, you are now looking at protesters being called thugs and rioters and looters rather than protesters. And so you say that because it will then warrant an appropriate police response, which I was, I was downtown uh, protest, you know, with the protests with other legislature, legislators with Attica Scott who um, filed Brianna's law. And, you know, we saw tanks, we saw tanks, we saw, we saw flash, I don't even know what the terminology is, smoke bombs, there were, it was just, it was a lot of military grade um, tactics that were being used against people that were literally just standing around um, in a downtown park. And, you know, you see something like that firsthand and you understand why people feel the need to go to the street. It's not being done on a policy level. It's not being done by elected officials. Um, and we've seen our attorney general, how he's handled it, which is all just cover up and misdirection and misinformation. But we saw that, you know, a lot in Louisville, with Louisville elected officials and within LMPD itself, where the information simply wasn't released or the wrong information was released. And so all of that combined makes it incredibly difficult to just say, no, just go back to trusting us like you used to. I think those days are gone, and I think we're going to need to work really hard on both sides. I think the uh, police everywhere, and again, this is, I'm speaking of Louisville, but I think this is happening all across the country, they're going to need to figure out what kind of reforms are needed internally so that they can start building trust back up in the community. Otherwise, things are not going to get any better. Um, and they could get worse. And again, the more you are sort of attuned to just the rhetoric rather than conversation, that's where the danger arises for more violent conflict because of this othering that we do to each other. Um, what do you, you know, you, you argue just kind of sticking on these issues of um, people first, right? Um, you argue that there must be accessible and affordable health care for all um, individuals in Kentucky. As a state representative, what legislation have you sponsored and supported uh, to make healthcare a right um, for the citizens and not a privilege? You know, that I'm gonna file legislation tomorrow that just does that, because I think we have forgotten that. I think we get bogged down in what kind of healthcare is available for whom. And, you know, what has happened is we have tied our health care access to employment. And so we have individuals, certainly during COVID, where you do not have that anymore. And so you've had to reestablish these safety nets that you've been eroding for, the, for so long, right? As soon as um, the new majority, the Republican majority, and I don't want to get partisan, but, but the policies are clear to see, right? Connect, which was held up as a national model, um, for the ACA, um, in order, in terms of getting a, you know, getting a healthcare program, accessing information about it, enrollment, that kind of thing, was dismantled, and it took millions and millions of dollars of taxpayer money to take away something that cost millions and millions of dollars to build, so that you could get access to healthcare. Um, and you know, we're now reestablishing it under Governor Bashir, but. It is, it is not happening at a fast or bold enough pace. Um, so that's just one thing. I think we need to make sure that individuals have health care, regardless of employment. I mean, it's not something that makes any sense where you're talking about people in the economy and then not allowing people to be healthy and going to work. Um, it, it, it's something that we're, again, seeing because of COVID. Some people get better health care. Some people don't get health care at all. Some people don't have insurance and go bankrupt because they got sick once or their child got sick once. Um, and it's, it's, it's just an untenable position. So there's, you know, there's a lot of piecemeal legislation, you know, caps on insulin, caps on prescription drugs, making sure that we can negotiate for drug prices. But those are band-aids largely. Um, there needs to be a shift and it's gonna have to be on a federal level just an entire shift in the mindset where we just need to prioritize access and availability of healthcare, quality healthcare for everybody. And all of the policies, once you prioritize that, then you're just talking about language in a bill. You can reallocate monies. We can find money apparently to build a wall. 
we can find money to do a lot of things that are not helpful to people, that are devastating our environment, our forests, our natural resources, but why are we not able to allocate some of that to basic fundamental needs like healthcare and food, uh, clean water, clean air? Um, you know, and it's just something that we, we, we're going to have to do. I'm, I'm certain that we will have something in the state legislature, um, you know, reestablishing connect, making sure that affordable health care is available. Um, because now that people have had a taste of it, they're not willing to let it go. Um, and they can't let it go. We're in the middle of a pandemic. It's not going to let up anytime soon. Sticking on the topic of uh, health care and this pandemic and, and uh, employment, unemployment, we know we have millions of people still unemployed. We've lost 250,000 Americans um, to the pandemic. Uh, and according to NPR, Kentucky is one of the states currently with unchecked COVID-19 community spread. Um, yeah. What do you believe is causing this spread? Um, mm -hmm. And do you believe in a state lockdown? So early on, um, we had mask, not mandates. I don't think they were ever mandates. Um, they were, I think, back in March, uh, enforced in terms of large gatherings outside, especially like in religious um, settings. But, you know, we've had a situation where the, our governor went on TV every day, every afternoon, and said, wear a mask. Wear a mask stay six feet apart, you know, don't stay indoors, uh, don't go to large gatherings. Um, and it's, it's something that was working because our numbers were not as high as some of our neighbors um, and some of the other like cities our size that we saw. Um, what happened was at some point that, that method was abandoned in favor of reopening the economy. <laughs> And I'll say it again, the economy is not this thing that exists outside of people who work to create the economy. It's not the stock market, right? It's not some projections on a computer. It's people, it's jobs, it's, it's their taxes, it's everything that they do every day to be productive citizens. And you know, one of the things that I find just incredible still is how a mask during a pandemic has become a political issue. I refuse to wear a mask because how dare you infringe on my freedoms. I don't care if I am going to kill you because I don't care enough about you to simply wear a mask when I'm speaking to you um, in a situation that is dangerous by any medical level, you know, CDC guidelines, World Health or the Organization guidelines. Um, it's all the same recommendations, and once we followed them, we were doing okay. This this idea of reopening the economy, though, I think has destroyed that. And so we are, I'm in Jefferson County, it's the red zone. We are going right back. The governor just issued guidelines, and he made it a point to say they're not mandates, they're just recommendations. Um, again, wear a mask, no large gatherings, you know, stay six feet apart, uh, don't go and eat in restaurants. It's, it's, these are not major things that I would call infringements on freedom, the way that they're being blown up to be uh, by certain people. And that rhetoric is literally killing people. Um, and that is why we are not reopening the way we should. We could have if we had just stuck to our guns, you know, through March, if we just stayed the course, we could be reopened now. We could have our children back in school now because we would have been used to it. Right. We would have been used to our kids. We could have taught them. You can social distance. You could go to church. You can go to the temple. Um, you, you would know the guidelines and you'd be able to do it safely. But at this point, we can't because we can't trust each other and to simply wear a mask. And that is that is why we are where we are. I mean, to put it very bluntly and, you know, our the White House, I think, said that we're not we're just not going to have ever have control over this. And they're putting their faith in vaccines, maybe. Um, that may be developed at some point. Um, there's, you know, little information about that, about the efficacy, the viability, the safety of anything that's being developed overseas. And really, a mask could have forestalled all of this. Um, and that is, it's, it's shocking. It really is shocking if you look at it objectively that, that a handful of people who 
have bought into some sort of rhetoric cannot see basic health principles for what they are and will instead disbelieve science and put their communities in danger for what for what you know um and so that's that's why we are where we are and we're not going to get out of it again unless we uh you know adhere to the guidelines and respect respect the lives of our neighbors Representative, I am so sad we are running short on time. Um, I feel like I have a million and two more questions to ask you. Um, so we'll save that for part two, hopefully sometime in the future. Um, but before we go, uh, where can people go to follow you and donate to your campaign? So you can find me on Facebook. You can just probably Google State Rep Nima Kulkarni. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Um, my website is votenema.com. Um, and I encourage people to go there. I've got um, updated voting information. We're almost to election day in Kentucky. We still have early voting going on. Um, and so Twitter, Facebook, votenema.com, you have a, I have a contact page there. But it's it's been an absolute pleasure being here and discussing these issues with you. Oh, the pleasure is ours. Thank you so much. Um, it was very fruitful conversation. I've learned so much. I know our viewers have too. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to join, uh, you'll be able to join us again soon. I would love to. Thank you for having me. Awesome. And to our viewers, thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time.